Bodang Dhammang Sangang Namasami. So welcome everyone. Today is Vesak, um, which marks the day in which the Buddha was born. Uh, it's also the day that he attained Nibbana or enlightenment, and it is also the day that he died. So it's very kind of auspicious, important day for Buddhists around the world. Um and so, yeah, today we're going to do a little bit of practice. We'll start with some meditation and I'll give a talk. And let's just start by getting into a comfortable posture. One that is both upright and relaxed. Spread your awareness throughout the whole body. Really feel what it's like to be here. And given this occasion, just take a moment to tune into the power of this state of Vesak. Just feeling the, the sort of gravity of this occasion. See if you can use the mind to perceive the power of this moment in history in which the Buddha, this human being who, you know, sat on this earth two and a half thousand years ago, sat beneath the Bodhi tree in India. You can think about this moment in which he broke through where his mind awakened from this dream. I like to imagine him sitting at nighttime, the moon full, which by the way is the mark of the of, of Vesak, which is always on a full moon. They use the lunar calendar. So I like to imagine this full moon. And the Buddha alone in a jungle, sitting beneath a giant Bodhi tree. The only one there to witness his awakening was the earth. It's, it's a beautiful scene of something so rare and something that we are still benefiting from to this day. So see if you can rouse energy to practice today. See if you can rouse a sense of gratitude, appreciation, and a sense of confidence, trust. So again, spread your awareness throughout your whole body. so that no part of your body is left unfilled with your awareness.
like to think about how the Buddha's endeavor to teach came from compassion. And so when we pick up these teachings, it's important to do so with a sense of respect. And, you know, just speaking for myself, I really can't imagine where I would be if it were not for these teachings. Samsara is like a whirlpool and we're drowning. And how lucky are we to live in a world where a Buddha arose to throw us a lifeline. And because of him, I, I feel that I have a fighting chance, and so do you, of being well, of being free, really free, we we have a chance at finding a, a footing in a place more blissful than heaven. This is what the Buddha stands for. He is a shining embodiment of what human beings are capable of, our capacity for awakening. our capacity to break through, to break through suffering, to break through the hindrances, the defilements, to come out of pain, to come out of delusion, confusion, And this image of the Buddha, you know, it's really so useful. We need to use it. And, you know, I feel that nowadays there's so many people interested in meditation. Um, and they, they almost want to practice in a way that's completely divorced from the teachings of the Buddha or, you know, any other tradition that one may turn to. Um, and I have to say that will be a lot harder. And part of the reason for this is that the Buddha, you know, the Buddha is this being that lived right on the earth who I've never met. And um, I've never spoken to him. I don't know what he looks like. Right. But he serves as an image in my heart that I can hold on to. And one of the things that's so powerful about this image is that it gives, or he gives an incredibly high standard, an incredibly high standard for, um, for the human heart, for how we can feel an incredibly high standard for wisdom virtue, kindness, compassion, determination, energy, effort, generosity, and so many other qualities. Um, and the standard is so high that the typical English word wisdom, for example, does not really get anywhere close to the type of wisdom that the Buddha uh, taught. And this is one of the things that 
I find is a difficulty in teaching. You know, if I if I praise wisdom, um, there are a lot of people out there who would consider themselves wise. Uh, and maybe they are wise in terms of, you know, what that word means colloquially, you know, what that word means in, in society today. But when the Buddha says wisdom, he's talking about something else. And another challenge with teaching is that so many of us are so used to comparing ourselves with those around us. And we're so crippled by fear, so crippled by our, our own self-judgment. Um, we're so in need of self-esteem that when we introduce these incredibly high standards for these qualities, um, we we tend to have trouble relating to those standards. You know, it's like if you're interested in playing basketball and, and you live on an island where there's no media, no TV, nothing, and you learn how to play basketball, you know, someone teaches you and, and you're the best person on that island. And then, uh, you know, one day you, you get off that island onto the mainland and you hear of LeBron James, right? So <laughs> there might be this kind of shock of, oh, there's a whole different standard that I wasn't aware of. And this, I run into this a lot um, when I try to share the teachings of the Buddha with others, where I find that people are um, taken aback by the Dhamma, these teachings, in, in some way. Uh, but, and it's, it's sort of regarded as bad news, like, oh, I'm not as far along as I thought I was. But it's not bad news. It, this is very good news. If... If we want to feel that we have already ascended, then that means that our quality of mental experience is as good as it gets. I don't know about you, but I want a higher quality of experience. So when I hear that there's a higher standard, and in particular that there's someone who achieved that, that is incredibly helpful, incredibly inspiring. So without kind of getting into that more without giving specifics, let me let me talk a little bit about some of these standards. So there's one little phrase I want to draw out from a sutta in ancient discourse. And uh, just for those who are interested, this sutta is called Punnaka's Questions. So this is Sutta Nipata 5.3, Punnaka Manava Pucha, Punnaka's Questions. And this is part of a very famous and important section of the suttas in which there's a Brahmin teacher who has 16 students um, and he essentially, he gets this like splitting headache and then he hears that there's a Buddha in the world, someone who is fully awakened. And so he sends his 16 students to go to that Buddha to ask some questions. This is like a very brief, uh, it's actually a really cool story, but that's it's just a very brief, might help you remember it. And so Punnika is one of these students. And he asks a bunch of questions, the last one of which, so the way this with the starts is like Punika asks about sacrifice, um, which was a common practice amongst some Hindu practitioners in India at that time. Um, it's unclear exactly what was being sacrificed, uh, but the Buddha tells him sacri sacrificing, let's say, animals is not going to get you um, to where you want to go. And so then Pun Punika asks, so if those who have been practicing sacrifice haven't crossed over the flood, um, 
dear sir, then who in the world of its divine beings and humans has crossed over the flood? Um, so this idea of crossing over the flood is sort of one who has ended the cycle of birth and aging and death, the cycle of rebirth. But it also stands for someone who has uh, overcome suffering, someone who's fully, fully free from suffering. So here, Punnika, in his own right, is a very accomplished Brahmin, which is the highest kind of spiritual caste in India. He's got a bunch of students and himself. And I'm assuming here that he's someone who's been practicing sacrifice probably for years, right? I mean, that, this is just guesswork here. So someone he's respecting is telling him that what he's been practicing isn't, isn't going to get him over the flood. So what will? The Buddha says, he who has fathomed the, the far and near in the world, Another translation is the high and low in the world. For whom there is nothing perturbing in the world, his vices evaporated, undesiring, untroubled, at peace. He, I tell you, has crossed over birth and aging. So there's a lot there, but I want to dial in on the phrase, for whom there is nothing perturbing in the world. So perturbing is another way of saying disturbing. So let's let's say that. For whom there is nothing disturbing in the world. His vices evaporated, undesiring, untroubled, at peace. Now, when I read that, it there's a couple things that reminds me that it's possible to train the heart, the mind, in such a way that there can be nothing in the whole world that would disturb us. So when I talk about high standards, this is what I'm talking about. And I've been playing with this phrase in my own practice for, I don't know, a week or so. And for me, it's so helpful. You know, so something bothers me. And I bring up that phrase, like for, for example, today, um, I had this package that was supposed to be delivered to my house instead of getting delivered. Uh, the mailman left a slip that says I need to go into the post office to pick it up. And I went online, I called, tried to figure out, figure this out, but I have to go into the post office, um, which annoyed me. Right. <laughs> but when I, when I was feeling that annoyance, and this is very slight, right? Not, not like I'm freaking out, but I'm feeling that annoyance. And then I remember this phrase, for whom there is nothing perturbing in the world. When I remember that, I can let go of that annoyance. So when we take this really high standard, it changes the blame game. So another example would be, um, let's say in relationship, whether it's uh, a spouse or a friend or a parent or a child, whoever. And something happens in the course of the relationship and we're upset. The immediate impulsive tendency is to externalize. You know, why does this person have to be that way? But this phrase from the Buddha reminds us that it's possible for someone else, someone more awakened than us, perhaps, to go through that exact same set of circumstances and not be perturbed, not be disturbed. And if we can take one thing from this phrase, if we can stop blaming others or external conditions for how we feel, for who we are, for how our life is, if we can just do that and we can, it's not that we wallow 
ourselves in self judgment or criticism or blaming ourselves, self pity. It's not that at all. It's a remembering that we have the capacity to be free, to be at peace. There's another sutta that uh, is also from the Sutta Nipata. This is 4.14. Uh, Duvattaka Sutta. Duvattaka Sutta, which means quickly. This is an excerpt where the Buddha says, Stilled right within, a monk shouldn't seek peace from another or from anything else. Let me say that again. Stilled right within. A monk or let's say a practitioner should not seek peace from another or from anything else. And I'll skip ahead here. As in the middle of the sea, it is still with no waves upwelling. So the monk, unperturbed, undisturbed, still should not swell himself anywhere. And of course, we can substitute monk with practitioner for those who are not monks and himself with herself for those of us who are female, right? Um, but let's dive into this a little bit. So this idea of stilling right within um, is, is really powerful to me. So here the Buddha is saying that when, when we're practicing the path, when we're practicing Dhamma, if we're interested in developing the skills of the Buddha, we're not meant to seek peace, to look for peace from others or from anything else. We are meant to find that within. We're meant to develop. This is the whole point. This is the skill of the Buddha. It's the skill of within ourselves, Coming to peace. It's hard to imagine a skill that would be more beneficial than this. And this is very against the grain for the world. What, what the world, what people in the world are really interested in doing is we want to change what's outside of us. We think that that's what the problem is. But that's not where the problem is. That's not where we can have success. And I'm not saying that we all need to stop working and stop doing all the things, you know, stop attending to things in our life, but just pay attention. Notice, is that making you happier? Is that, is that, you know, experiment with it. If, if you really feel that you need to do X, Y, Z to, find peace give yourself a you know set, set a deadline do that do xyz see if that brings you peace you know the the other thing that comes to my mind when i when i read that phrase stilled right within is in the buddha's descriptions of the higher heavens what are called the brahma realms Right, so these are uh, sort of realms or frequencies of of experience, of being, of perception that we can be born into, and we can even uh, touch them and dwell in them as human beings through meditation. But these, are, in his descriptions of the higher heavens, um, you find beings who are sort of feeding on their own. Uh, 
you know, feeding on their own sort of consciousness, their consciousness is at a level of joy or rapture or happiness or equanimity or beyond. And so that's just their normal sort of experience of the world. So they don't need to feed on things outside of them. But here in the human realm, not only are we feeding on food and looking for food to bring us happiness or whatever, but we're feeding on everything else around us. So you'll notice if you walk into a room and you start having a conversation with someone, you start feeding on that conversation. And if it's a good conversation, you feel good. But if it's a bad conversation, you start to feel bad. You know, um, we're feeding on the weather. We're feeding on our jobs. We're feeding on what emails are coming through to our inbox. We're feeding on social media as we're swiping through our phones. We're, we're feeding on external things. And we're looking for happiness, peace, joy, et cetera, from all those things that we're feeding on. So the Buddha is recommending a, a training that in which we learn how to feed on something from within ourselves. And so we can think of uh, the practice of samadhi and jhana, these sort of deeper uh, realms or territories of experience that we can uh, step into in meditation and, and in life. In, in those territories, we get to experience amazing qualities of bliss and pleasure and beyond that arise from within us. And we get to feed on that. So anyway, yeah, I just, I'm really, I'm, I really am just trying to hammer home this very core concept in, in the Buddha's Dharma that we can't blame anything outside of us for how we feel. It's not that we can't blame, we can, but we're not going to get anywhere if we do. And moreover, we can become stilled right within. And that we can develop our hearts such that there will be nothing disturbing in all the world. I'm going to read another quote from the Buddha that is a little bit easier to kind of wrap our heads around. He said, I know not of any other single thing that brings such woe as the mind that is untamed, undeveloped, uncultivated. Such a mind indeed brings great woe. I know not of any other single thing that brings such bliss as the mind that is tamed, developed, and cultivated. Such a mind indeed brings great bliss. I know of no other thing that brings such woe, such suffering as the mind that is untrained. Such a mind indeed brings great woe. This is helpful to repeat when we suffer. Once again, we have to fight that impulse to blame someone else, to blame an external circumstance, and to realize instead that it is the mind that is untamed, uncultivated, that brings this woe. And then to, to really motivate ourselves
you know, how much energy do we spend doing this and that day in and day out, working, going to social obligations, doing all kinds of things day after day, week after week, year after year. And nobody's making that choice for you. You're choosing how you spend your time and energy. So it's a choice that you can consider. And the Buddha's words of encouragement are again are, I know of no other single thing that brings such bliss, such happiness as the mind that is tamed, that is trained, that is cultivated. Such a mind indeed brings, brings such bliss, such happiness. Now I want to talk a little bit about training. Um, this is a sutta that I think is very important, very helpful, and I think you guys are going to like it. I find it to be very uplifting, very re reassuring, and um, yeah, I just think it's really needed in the world today. And I have a couple different translations, and I'm going to try and go back and forth and pick pick the wording that I like the most. Um, but this sutta is called Chaitanya Sutta. Chaitanya Sutta, that's C-E-T-A-N-A. -A. And there are multiple Ch Chaitanya Sutta. So this one is 11.2 from uh, Anguttara Nikaya. It's translated as making a wish. In some translations... Um, it's also translated as an act of will. So making a wish or an act of will. I'm going to kind of paraphrase a little bit. have like three different translations here, sorry. Okay. For a person endowed with sila or virtue, who's consummate or skilled in virtue, skilled in goodness, um, virtue is, is about our behavior, right? How we think, speak, and act. And um, thinking, speaking, and acting in a way that is aligned with goodness that in a way that does not harm ourselves or harm others, right? That in very brief is what is meant here by virtue. So again, for a person endowed with virtue, consummate in virtue, there is no need for an act of will or to make the wish, may I have no regrets. It is the nature of things that to have no regrets arises in a person endowed with virtue consummate in virtue. Okay, so basically the Buddha is saying, for someone who is virtuous, there's no need to wish, may I have no regrets. It's just natural that non-regret arises in a person who is endowed with and skilled in virtue. And for a person who's free from regrets, There is no need to wish may uh let's see may happiness arise in me. Happiness naturally arises in one who is free from regrets. And for a person who has happiness, by the way, I've heard this translated as gladness as well gladness, happiness, right? For someone who has that, there's no need to wish, may pithy arise in me. Pithy arises in a person with a happy or glad mind. So pithy, if you don't remember, is the Pali word for uh, a rapture, a heart that is uplifted, joyful, 
it also refers to a physical kind of sensation or energy perception that manifests physically in the body of a sort of tingling, vibration, tonal, sort of very pleasurable sensation. Okay, now to continue for, for someone who is endowed with piti, there's no need to wish may uh, pasadi arise. So here the translator is calling pasadi lightness in the body. It's often translated as tranquility, calmness, right? So for, for someone who has piti, there's no need to wish may pasadi or calmness arise. It naturally arises. And for someone with pasadi, there's no need to wish, may I experience sukha? Sukha is translated typically as pleasure or happiness. It's more refined than piti. It's more subtle. Um, we can think of it as this emotional quality of happiness, also with a physical quality of, of pleasure. But we're getting more subtle and more refined here. And for someone who has uh, a mind endowed with sukha, there's no reason to wish, may I have samadhi? So samadhi, you probably know this word. I, I don't like to translate it as concentration. Samadhi is a coming together. It's a collectedness, a gathering. It's a state of being that most people don't really get to experience or experience very infrequently. Uh, but it's a beautiful state of being characterized by wellness, uh, confidence, strength. It's a coming together, a harmony of the body, mind, and all the elements of our being. And for someone who has samadhi, there's no need to wish, may I know and see the true nature of things in the world. It's just natural for one with samadhi to see and know the true nature of things in the world. For a person who knows and sees things as they are, there's no need to wish, may I feel disenchantment. It's the nature of things that a person who knows and sees things as they are comes to feel disenchanted. So this idea of disenchantment, it's, uh, I'm going to try and explain this as brief as possible, so I'm going to miss out on a lot, but it's sort of like when we see what conditions give rise to suffering, what causes us pain, fear, we 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 recognize that in the world and normally the putta says that we one of the mistakes that we make is that we see pleasure in what is painful we we are attracted to things that actually bring us suffering so we in through this process of waking up we become disenchanted and and we stop not only are we disenchanted with those things um, we we actually changed how we feel about them in terms of they no longer seem as real as they seemed before. We recognize them as fabricated. So we, we become disenchanted. For someone who feels disenchantment, there's no need to wish, may I grow dispassionate. Again, this is a tough word. Disenchantment, dispassion are not words that we typically associate uh, with positive things for you know, modern day people, but in this context, they're very positive. Um, I'll, have, I'll have to say that for another talk, just for just due to a lack of time here. Uh, for a person who is dispassionate, there's no need for an act of will or to wish, may I realize the knowledge and vision of release? Let's see if I can find another translation for that. So this is called Vimutti Nyanandasana. I'm butchering the Pali here. Um, oh, sorry, I, I misspoke there. Okay, here's another translation. For, for a person who is dispassionate, there's no need to wish, may I be free for cra of cravings for things in this world. It's natural that one who is dispassionate becomes free for, from craving, from desiring. Um, we 
we can naturally become free from feeling like we're lacking, feeling like we need this and we need that and we want that. And without those things, we can't be happy. That goes away. And then finally, for a person who's free from cravings, there's no need to wish, may I realize the final release from all suffering. This is that Vimuthi Nanadasana. Uh, this is basically saying there's no need to wish that I'll be liberated, that I'll find enlightenment or Nibbana. When one is free from cravings, this naturally happens. Okay, so there's a long sutta here, but I want to go back to the very beginning here. And the the kind of feeling I get from this sutta, and I was listening to a talk that Ajahn Suchito gave on this sutta recently, you, you get this image or the sense that when you sufficiently develop a causal condition like virtue, and that sufficiently grows, it wells up, then it naturally kind of overflows into the next thing. And I remember Ajahn Suchito was giving this image, which I believe is found in the suttas, of rain that comes down and falls on a hillside. That rain naturally trickles into a creek, and that naturally trickles into, uh, let's say, a small river. And then that naturally flows into a lake, then it naturally flows into a great river, then naturally comes into the ocean, right? So if you think of that rain coming on the hillside, if there's just a little bit of rain, it'll get the soil wet. It's not going to flow anywhere. But if, it, there's a, if there's a huge downpour, right, it'll soak up the ground and it'll start to flow flow into the next thing. And then if that next thing has enough water, it'll, right, it'll um, well up, fill up. So this is, this is the, the way that we can practice. We don't need to force the next thing. We don't need to force non-regret. And by the way, again, the Buddha, when the Buddha does not regret, I can't tell you how many people... <laughs> who would hear that and say, oh yeah, I don't have any regrets. That's not how I live my life. Um, if you're thinking that your, your definition of non-regret is too gross, you regret is something that happens all the time in more, in a more subtle fashion. And we need to learn how to become attuned to that. You know, even as something as simple as um, eating a bag of Doritos and then we regret that or sitting on the couch and watching TV for two hours and we regret that. Right. Or, you know, you get into an argument with your spouse and you say something, you, you, you speak out when you have anger in your heart and then you regret that. Right. So if we want to live a life of absolutely no regrets, we can start by perfecting this quality of virtue, sila. And that'll give you some insight into what sila really means how how much it can be developed. It can be developed to such an extent that we can be completely free from regret. So again, this is an extremely high standard of sila. And then we can see how that naturally, that non-regret naturally turns to happiness or gladness. And that naturally becomes piti, rapture. That naturally becomes pasadi, then sukha, then samadhi, and so on, all the way to nibbana. So one of the things that's very reassuring about this sutta is it's it's almost like saying we don't need to push our way there. We're learning how to linger, how to flow, how to develop qualities that are very practical, that come into our day-to-day -day life. You know, if you just sit and think about your whole day what did you do that that you know created regret and then you vow not to do that anymore right this is the practice bit by bit and i'll lastly i'll just mention there's another sutta called megya sutta which is somewhat similar i won't get into it due to time constraints but um and that's what the Buddha talks about, kind of a, a causal condition that brings about 
sila or virtue. So kind of one step before this, if you will. Um, now you, you can't really cut and splice suttas. So this is just my interpretation. But in that sutta, it's clear that you know, the Buddha says that proximity to the Kalyana Mitta, which means wise, admirable, beautiful friends, that is a causal condition for the, the development of sila. So once again, as we're coming to a close here, spread your awareness throughout the whole body. Letting go of what does not belong. Dialing down the manas, the, the thinking mind, the organizing mind, the organizer of thoughts, and tuning into the chitta, the aspect of the being that feels. May all beings share in the blessings springing from this practice and teaching. The Amit the Buddha, the worthy one, the blessed one, the fully self awakened one. I honor him and I am grateful. Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, Namasami.